Okay, welcome to our latest video. This is our Butterfly Believe project. And what, what I've done here is a little bit something different. I've done two projects to show you. This is a wall plaque. So you hang that on your wall, hang your keys or your purse or your stuff on there, hair ribbons, necklaces, um, bathroom, entryway. It's kind of a little bit of a piece that can go in a lot of rooms in your house. And then this um, herb mini anyway tray was so popular that I decided to show you that we could just flip that board over except for then you wouldn't be able to see it when I go to show so I painted a new one um, flip that board over and I've got the same layout so that and I, I want to do a seashell and I want to do you know a rose I want to do all kinds of stuff on there so um, and then because I had just recently done the rose coaster box um, and we've got these new essential pieces we've taken one of those coasters so you could put a rose here and do believe um, you could put a seashell there and put Believe. You could change it out if you wanted to. Um, but I wanted to show how these pieces could kind of be mixed and matched. And then we've got our new um, um, embellishments. We've got corner, em corner embellishments here. We've got, um, these are title plates. We're using metal powders. We've got a little stencil action going, some texture medium. Um, just lots and lots of things to see. Um, we've got some crackle hidden under here. Um, when you watch the video, you might see that this started out life as a tan area. And then I decided that I didn't like the tan, and I kind of walked through why and, and how we're going to change things and stuff like that. So, um, But the colors go together. You could make one or the other. You could do both um, and hang them up in the same room, that kind of thing. So I hope you enjoy the project and, um, and all the lessons that we have in here for you. All right, as we, well, we've got these wood surfaces that we're calling essentials, and um, I've been so excited about them and doing so many things with them. But what I want to show you is um, we had so much fun playing with these. Um, the ultimate destination for our project today is going to be that we're going to put three of these on the plaque here. And then we're going to use these fantastic knobs on here, and then these versions of corners on the corners of them, okay? And that's gonna be like a little hanging for your necklaces or your um, keys or things like that. Okay, so we had, you know, that's great, that's fine. But if you twisted it and turned it this direction, then you have, you just have your, um, you turn your plaques, you've got butterfly, dragonfly, butterfly, and then maybe you do some scrolls or something here and you just hang it going long ways. Or you could go, this direction and you could put like a spring word or uh, live love laugh down the middle down the sides here there's so many things you can do and then we've got the tray bottom for the the small anyway tray and you could go on here and you could just do a two plaque and do the same set of circumstances so we've combined the rectangles with the little squares and then take it one step further and I had used this square for the um, for the coaster and glued the coaster backs which um, um, you just hot glue them on and so then you if you do not want to have um, something that hangs then you could do what we did what we did with the coaster box whoops that's the back okay so you could paint these emblems on the sides of a coaster box and make them into coasters and store everything into your coaster box using these feet instead of these corners and the knob on top. So just very versatile that you can flex things around and if affordable, very, very affordable. The edges are burned. It's a really compressed, nice thickness, not too thick, not too thin um, MDF board. <clears throat> loving, loving, loving them. Um, and they just, they're just holding up and working so well. Um, and the, I can't tell you enough um, on this coaster that I painted it, because of the crispness, um, like my husband was my wood woodworker for years, but the saws that they use for woodworking does not give you this machined edges and corners that you get when you have um, this um, laser cut surface. They feel like they're store-bought. They, they just have a better feel. So it's, it's just really an amazing kind of difference. <clears throat> and I think, you know, this isn't, I don't have smell-o-vision yet or, or touch-o-vision, so um, I try to give you as many visual pictures as I can. Well, the first thing that we want to talk about is what kind of sealer you would use with this. Um, 
I'm going to use cork sealer. I'm going to paint two projects that are companion pieces, um, and on one of them, this is the tray bottom, on the, the tray bottom and or if I wanted to make these into coasters, I'm going to use cork sealer on that because I want to prevent any liquids from getting in, and cork sealer is actually what they use um, to prep the um, duck decoys when they're um, carving the duck decoys and um, entering them in competitions or using them or whatever. So if this will prevent any water getting into the cork for the ducks and keep the ducks buoyant, then it will prevent any liquids spilling on my tray or my coasters um, from harming anything. But then say I don't think that um, I'm going to use this as coaster or I'm not going to do a tray bottom, then what I would use is multi-purpose sealer. This is a good surface for um, just about any surface, not the um, plastics and the waxes and the soaps and the Really, really, I wouldn't use it on tin. It can be used on tin. I really like the um, paint adhesion medium for that. Okay, and as I open up um, a new Gray Matters palette, um, I'm reminded every time, I always throw away my cover because I, I don't like how it makes my pages flex right there. And I can never get it wrapped around correctly, so I always just take it off. But I'm reminded that they have all of this art education on the back side. And the gray palette is a, is a color neutral palette for your mixing. So if you're going to be doing any mixing, this is the kind of palette that you want to use. And if you don't have a gray palette and you want to get um, a gray scale, then when you place an order, we'll put in one of these new business cards that is a color wheel, um, gray scale, and ruler, and it's a bookmark, and you know it of course has our um, website information on it. But we'll toss in one of these when you place your order so that you can at least have the gray scale. All right, I'm going to seal, and so I wanted to introduce you to a new um, new supply. This is something that you could flip sides. You could hold it back here, or you can hold it right here. And the foam um, is a good, dense foam. And um, what I like about this is there's no need to don gloves. You can just keep it held way back here, um, and so it keeps your hands out of the mess. And if you've ever used multi-purpose sealer before, when you get it on your fingernails or around your cuticles and stuff like that, it's such a good sealer, it seals to your fingers. That's not what you optimally want to have happen. So when you're going on here with this, you can use it wet or dry, but you want to wring it out. Um, and there's two sizes, okay, so different project sizes, and you just keep them rinsed out and they'll last and last. Okay, then you just are going to wipe, okay. Now what it doesn't do is keep it off this hand, so you might still need a Donna glove for this hand. Okay, so I get that on there, and then to do my edges, I'm just going to go along like this and then blot up any drips. Okay, really fast way to um, seal a piece of wood. And then I can lay it right here on my nonstick mat because that will wipe right off. No, nothing sticks to this that I found yet. I even have a hard time. I've got two of these taped together um, at the bottom, and I have a hard time getting the tape to stick to this to keep them down on the edge of the table. So um, kind of funny that I can't even tape it to the table, but um, excellent nonstick surface, um, hot glue, epoxy, anything doesn't stick to this. So in the case of prep versus um, laying around, I don't mind things laying on top of my, <clears throat> my nonstick thing here, but when I get to my big old giant piece here, it's going to take up all the room, or all of my little blocks are going to take up all the room on my nonstick mat. So I'm going to use these um, little pyramids. They're non-stick. You can screw them down to a surface if you want to. I prefer them to be flexible so that I can make, you know, big or small um, places to set things. But then I can set that out over away from my non-stick mat, and then I can continue to prep my other surfaces so that I can make a mess here, dry it here, and it extends for a very, very affordable price, the price of my non-stick mat by not having to place sticky items all over my non-stick mat. So, um, yeah, really, really a cool little device. Okay, one of the goals of this was to make a second um, tray insert for this um, smaller size anyway tray. This is a perfect size for a couple of wine glasses, a bottle of wine, um, snacks, cheese, drinks, <clears throat> that kinds of things, smaller items that you want, and it doesn't take up a big surface, so you could use it on a small side table. And we really fell in love with the, um, the herb pattern and stuff, uh, but we, we realized that we want to change things when we can to be seasonal. The Anyway tray inserts just pop out from the bottom, and um, they have a very secure iron framework for them so that you can put whatever you want in there. 
and it's very easy. These are also reversible, so you can paint on back and front. These little um, marks here are just laser burn marks, and they don't leave any, um, they don't actually have a texture or anything. It's just where the smoke from the laser, when it burned the edges, um, has gone around. <clears throat> and so what we'll do is we'll apply, yes, the cork sealer that is tough to open. Okay, so we'll apply the cork sealer to put it on my palette, and it's got a little bit of a thicker consistency. Okay, and I want to make sure because my jar is getting tough to open, make sure you do clean up the edges when you are um, finishing up. That way, you don't end up with jars that you can't get open. <clears throat> okay, so we'll just go with. I use the smaller size because I've got the other one in the varnish or in the water. And we'll just go ahead and just apply that to this. It's the same exact thing. In this case, um, this is something that you're going to want to seal all the sides and edges and make sure that you do a good thorough job. The nice thing is it does turn dark when it's sealed, so it does give you an indication of where you've been. Um, the beauty of an applicator like the varnish sponge or like this one is that these apply such a scant amount that you never have to worry about ridges and um, things like that so um, you're not going to have to worry about buildup and your paint or your medium will dry almost instantly it's very wow. beneficial it makes painting so much faster when you don't have to constantly wait for everything to dry Okay, one last thing about these little spiky, spooky thingies. Um, they are um, little painter's pyramids, and this side it can be wet. As you can see, that those dark spots are still wet. And I can go ahead and do the back side, and I can put this wet right on these spikes, and that they won't stick, and they don't mar the surface. I don't know how they get by with that, but they don't. Um, I've even checked it with base coating on a really smooth surface, um, and they do a fantastic job. So they are perfect when you want the edges to be dried or be able to approach edges too. They are a painter's friend because once again I'm always about how do you get an extra pair of hands. I paint by myself mostly um, so I can put this this way and allow it to dry or I can dry it this way. Either way is fine. Um, it doesn't scratch when you roll it around or whatever. Um, and they're, they come like in a whole big stack of them like eight or something like that. Maybe even more than eight. Um, and so you can do a couple of projects out with just one set. Now when I'm getting ready to clean up, I've taken my big sponge and I've just put it in the back over here and just made sure it's wedged down in there. Um, that'll keep it wet and so that I don't have to worry about cleanup. I can fit my other sponge in there and just leave it there until I'm ready to clean it up. And then I'll squish them out with water. And you can use the same ones for varnishing um, or base coating or um, any kind of medium that you want to apply. So you don't have to have special sets for each one. They can be interchangeable. You can use them squeezed out and damp or you can use them dry. Alright, I've got these fantastic new three-part stencils. Um, let's get these out of here and let's take a look at them. A little bit of a difference because they come in a color. Okay, so the way that these work is these are just kind of all different designs. This is a fantastic all over pattern. You can flip it and go this way. It has a repeat built into it and it shows you where to position with this little white lines. That way you know exactly where um, where your next leaf would sit if you were to repeat it. Okay, and that's one piece. And then these are an overall scroll pattern set. Um, a little leaf set would look fantastic with roses, oh my gosh. Um, great dragonfly and then a skinny um, repeating um, floral vine. <clears throat> and then here we've got a great bird and a round vining area. A kind of, this one looks like, is this leaves? Yeah. And then um, a skinnier scroll and a skinnier vine. So we've got fantastic possibilities with this. I can think of 90 things I want to do with it, like right this second. Um, what I am going to do with these is I'm going to use something. Let's see, I think the simpler scroll. I think I'm going to use this scroll, and I think I'm going to use it on the bottom of my um, plaque. This is the one I think I'm going to use. Now that I'm looking at that, I'm wondering if I'm lying, um, but I think so. So what I would do, decide is 
maybe I'm going to want the scroll to go in this direction with the leaves pointing that way. I would want to apply my tacket over and over. And then in an epiphany moment, that is so silly because I didn't think of it myself, you can, instead of tack it over and over, you can tape stencils right through their um, stencilness. Say I'm going to do the vines in green, I don't want the leaves. Um, this one might not be fair, but that tucks it fairly strongly down there, and that means that you might not have to use the tacket over and over. Personally, I don't want any bleed under. I, I want to eliminate that, and I don't mind my stencils being sticky. This would be one of those things where I also might, um, I might cut this stencil out so I have a less large. I love that they're large. I love that you get so much value for your money. But I might keep it so that I don't have to deal with all of this stuff hanging around and just cut them down to a smaller, um, a smaller functional piece. In order to get the back of my stencil sticky, I'm going to use a piece of um, wax paper and I'm going to lay it on there and then I'll remove this. So I'll put my sticky on the back, I'll put my tacket over and over on there and that's the tack it over and over makes the um, makes the stencil be like a giant post-it note, and it holds it down. The thicker you put it on, the more tack it has. And you can use tack it over and over to make um, temporary posters for your children's room. You can use it on a piece of fabric and make a lint um, a lint roller kind of thing because it will reactivate um, when you um, when you sorry. When you wash it in water, in hot soapy water, the sticky will stay. It's not sticky under the water, but then as soon as it dries, it's sticky again. And it doesn't leave a residue, and it's non-acid and all that kind of stuff. So because this is such a large stencil, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my ink sweeper, and I'm going to... I'm going to see how I'm blotting it off over here? <clears throat> I don't want to do this like that, because what will happen is um, I will end up with this big wad of stuff and it will be super sticky and I don't want to wreck the stencil when I'm taking it off and on um, but this um, product is actually meant to use with fabric for appliques um, and it's brilliant I love it I don't have to make this whole thing sticky it would be really fast if I just took a roller and just roll over it but um, because I don't want to make everything sticky um, I'm just gonna go ahead and be selective so I can just use my ink sweeper and go along the path of the stencil itself I'm going to save some of my product. It's not going to be tacky everywhere. And so I'll just go around the product, uh, around the cutouts. Okay. And I think that that's going to be brilliant. We could almost call this the How to Make Painting Easier for You and More Affordable episode. Um, this is a new improvement. These um, fingertip daughters have caps now and you can buy them individually. You can buy them in the three pack or you can buy them um, in the, the singles, which I think is just great. If you just want to add one to an order, um, then you don't have to buy three. You can wash them out over and over. And this is the jumbo dauber, but I want to show you this is one that we missed when we were doing a big group project. You can kind of hear it. Um, that did not get washed out. Now, what would be interesting to me, and this will be an experiment, and I wanted to tell you, um, when you have the tacket over and over, if you wash it out right away, then you can use this. It's nice and flexible, and you can use it again for paint or tacket. And this is one that's been used and washed over and over. Once you go to these, you, you will be, like, sold. They're amazing. Uh, they're not just for scrapbooking or whatever. <clears throat> and here's an example of one of the things that we did with tacket. I simply took the lid off my tacket over and over and I dipped my pencil into it and I made it into a grabber so it dries clear and now I can just grab um, anything that I want that it that's not too heavy for it and it is so great we needed to get into a tight little space and pick up a screw and I could just reach right on in there and right out okay um, just a versatile versatile product um, you would never believe Okay, a tip that somebody sent in is they took a cap off of an empty paint bottle for their um, brush cleaner and restorer, um, and then it squirts out much more controlled fashion than it did um, 
when it comes out of the, um, the pour cap. <clears throat> now what I want to do, I will tell you right up front, um, the brush cleaner and restorer will clean just about anything out, any kind of residue out of your brushes. Let me find a brush here that I can show you. <clears throat> And like I don't have any dirty brushes and I'm sure that's a lie but I've cleaned so many of them on camera um, so this is on gray paper but you'll see this is releasing pink right away okay so it just cleans out your brush right away now if you want extra extra scrubbing power power and containment then you just pour some into the well here and then you can scrub on this side okay but on your palette is great if you haven't let things dry and harden that's certainly doable. And then use your third well for rinsing off the residue. <clears throat> okay, so what I want to do, so my, my caveat to the brush cleaner is, is paint is a plastic, a form of plastic, and so is this foam. So by putting this foam in this plastic, I may just eat the foam, but I'm willing to try it to see if it'll clean that hard, plas that hard paint off. And I haven't tried this before, so I don't know if it'll work without destroying the applicator, but look at its taking that, it'll take the stuff right out of your clothes. Okay, so we're making like a little pink applicator out of our stuff. It is softening it. And whether or not it's eating that foam, looks like that's poofy, but I don't know why that's poofy. <clears throat> it's definitely absorbing. I'm not getting what looks to be a foamy residue on my palette. Definitely, like, I don't know if you can see, it's got a little dome happening thing there. Okay. And that was really hardened on that one side, so there must have been a lot of paint on there. Okay. Huh. Very interesting. All right, now that I've got it softened, I'm going to go try washing it in the sink, and I'm going to see what we get. Alright, so here's what I have. I have a very soft um, sponge that looks like it's in one piece. I don't know how many times you could do that. <clears throat> but it seemed to totally do what I needed it to do. It's stained purple, but the hardness is gone. Um, one thing that it did do, I got some on my hands and had it on the handle, and it took the lacquer off of the plastic on the handle as I was doing it. So now it's not shiny on this side. Um, so that's kind of funny that it took the lacquer off of that, but um, excellent. So now you can rescue the ones that you've trashed. I can't tell you how many I've had to throw away um, because I've forgotten to clean them out completely. So now we'll peel this off. And one thing about the wax paper will make a good barrier when it's, um, when it hasn't been used over and over again. But if you try to stick that back on, um, if you try to stick it back on the wax paper, it does peel the paper residue off. And so it does not make a good temporary um, residing place for the stencils. It's not quite dry yet. When it's clear, it's dry, but I think I had some that snuck under, which is exactly why you use the product, and it's not quite cured on that side. So just regular freezer paper. Um, you tear it to size. I won't tear it on camera because I think that loud and sudden noises would be bad. All right, I've got the sheet. Now mine is getting to the end, so it's getting a little curly. We used one product. What did we use? Oh, we tried the um, baking sheets, and the baking sheets um, totally released, like the parchment, the parchment paper, totally released instantly. It didn't even stick it to the baking sheet at all. Anyway, so you can get that, and it's not a super heavy hold. How to argue with a stencil. Anyway, you can make this, what I like about this, you can make it any size you want, and then you can um, easily cut it to size, and you could punch this and put it in a binder. Okay, most of us are familiar, this thing is full, with these fantastic things for holding magazines. Um, this is um, just priceless for organization. I've got a million of these from Ikea. Um, and I wanted to share... Um, when I have things that I need to know, um, if you take post-it notes and you color code by season, um, that's a really good I way to be able to tell where your favorite Christmas project is. So if pink is Christmas, then you could put pink 
where all the Christmas projects are in the magazines that you have, and then you'll know that that's at least it's a Christmas project. So when you get close to that, um, when you're trying to flip to the page you want, you can go right to it because of these little tabs. If you keep the little pads of these real skinny ones, then you can color code as you're looking through the magazine. It makes it really easy um, to locate things. But I, the reason I have this out while we're talking about stencils, we had the round turntable stencil holder, but this little guy right here is very much, and sorry, it's a little distorted. This is very much like this device for your, um, your magazines. It's about the same size. Um, and it's a little bit wider, but what this will do for you is you can put this right on a shelf, just like the magazine holder, and, um, and then you can hang your stencils, and there's tons of room, and because you can um, decide how tight to pack them, if they're a little bit sticky, they won't harm each other if they're sitting right next to each other, and there's, um, comes with a whole pile of these little clips. But a couple of these put right on your bookshelf, and then you can organize them by um, every day, um, seasons, whatever way you want to organize them. But this, very sturdy, not flimsy at all, um, not super expensive, and boy, I've got a sticky pile again because I didn't have room for the turn, um, the spinning one. So, and this also holds these real wide ones. Um, I don't know if you can see. Let's get you on camera. Um, so, it, this one is an 8.5 by 11, and it's got plenty of room down below. And then this is the 12-inch one, and it's still got a couple inches down below. So, um, plenty of room, wonderful, wonderful um, tool for storage. Okay, now this is very, very sticky, but yet not um, residue sticky. So now when I seal it down, I can push all of those areas down and they're going to stay nice and nice and tight and I won't be able to get paint underneath them. I've got this beautiful background paper that has some scrolls and some background images and some butterfly words on it. And this is what I want to put my painting of my butterflies and dragonflies on there. Um, I, my surface has a little bit of um, raised um, feeling to it, so I'm going to knock that back with my sanding disc. The neat thing about this is that's much, listen, you can hear it. I can just switch between a couple discs, and I always know where my sanding discs are. I don't have to find that one sheet of um, paper. <clears throat> one sheet of trace of sanding paper that would be like the right grit or whatever. Okay, I think that's perfect. So I'll get these others sanded and we'll be ready to apply our paper. Now I don't know if I'm going to be able to get two, um, both of my projects out of this one sheet of paper, but we'll do a dry run so I can see if I want, I know I'm going to paint over this side with, um, I want the same layout as this one. So I know I'm going to paint here and here. So I want to look for a place that's real pretty. I might want this upper corner to have those scrolls. Okay, so that might be a good place. And I might go ahead and start off the piece so I can trim it exactly to edge. So like a little eighth of an inch there. Okay, so I, I kind of like that look. That's the thing that you want to do. Now maybe I want my butterfly word to go straight through. Like, or maybe I want this butterfly word to go straight through so you could tell what it's saying. Okay, that is a decision you'll have to make yourself. Yeah, I may want a butterfly word. I'll play with that. But what you'll do, because it's going to be your personal preference, is you might lay that out and say, okay, right about there, and then see if... Uh, we're not going to be able to. So you're going to have... The good news is, well... We could if we turn sideways, but then the words wouldn't be right. Um, the good news is if you have two sheets, you won't have to sacrifice choices um, because of the, um, you won't have to choose, I want the scroll on this and no, no scrolls on this and stuff like that. Now what I'll do is I'll use the triple threat on the gray. So it has a gray lead and you just click it to make it extend, okay, to get a little bit longer. I want this to be straight, so you do want to make sure. Let's get out a measuring device. I want to make sure that I have um, my lines straight. So what I'll do instead of measuring, this is a see-through. This is the reason you use see-through rulers. Um, it's flexible, so if I wanted to paint wine glasses, I could go around the edge of my wine glass. And it is also self-centering, so if you want to find the middle and measure out. Um, very, very useful tool. Um, I've had one of these in my paint bag probably for about 20 years. Um, okay, so I want to lay that down there and make sure my edge is straight. OK, 
Okay, my edge is straight, so I'm going to put that about there. Maybe I want a little bit more scroll. Do I want to... And then that butterfly will show. That'll be pretty cool. Okay, so my edge is straight. Then we'll just measure and make sure that we're on it straight. Okay, and we'll mark. Okay, this will erase off, but I don't think we'll need to worry about that. This comes, the leg comes off with water, spit, varnish, um, eraser. But now I'll know which area I want to apply this onto here with. I won't pre-trim it to the exact thing because I want to trim it after to the exact edge. That will be more careful, but now I'll know exactly like where I'm headed. I probably don't want butterfly words on my um, dragonfly one, so I'll go up here in this upper corner for that. And then once again, make sure I'm straight. Okay. And then, you know, I'll do my other one someplace else on here. You can save these pieces and you can glue them on top of other papers. Okay. Now to be able to, um, to be able to place this easier, I'm going to go ahead and cut them all out so that when I'm trying to place them, I'll be able to line up that like bottom line or whatever. We're going to use the um, deco or deco page, decoupage medium, and that is actually how you say it. Because it's separated, I thought it was deco page. Um, but this is the matte finish, and it dries um, with a matte um, sheen so that you can actually paint, and your paint won't beat up and slide off. Um, if you have any reactivating at all, leave it alone, and it, when the paint dries, it will um, harden back down. But I've only had that happen once or twice, and I think I did something like totally sanded my surface too much or something like that. I couldn't figure out what was different, but I knew something was different. Um, but I've done enough of these now that I totally trust the product. <clears throat> okay, so we're just going to put a nice even coat of this on these. Okay, and actually we really should be working one by one, so I'll put this aside and we'll work on the papers. Okay, now what you don't want to have happen is you don't want the papers to get uh, messy on the front or the stuff will peel off. So you want to make sure that you've got a spot, and actually where's that freezer paper, right? That would be a perfect thing. So I've got a little sheet of wax paper, and then I'll go ahead and do my paper. And I'm going to hold it down while I'm doing this. If I don't want my hands sticky, I can put my gloves on. You want to make sure that you put a nice even coat but put enough on there to make it that, you know, that may have been one of the variables. I may have been doing it too scant. And you don't really have to move quickly. Um, I haven't found that this is a too um, difficult a task. I don't want to move that through the glue, though. That's what I don't want to do. Okay, I'm dealing with much smaller pieces of paper. There's less weight to them. So now I'll come over here to my coaster. Not my coaster, maybe, huh? And I'm going to apply that onto the surface using that line. And make sure I'm kind of straight on my edge. Wow, that worked really slick. Okay. And now we apply um, pressure and bray it out. Okay. Yeah. I kind of like working with these little pieces. Just make sure you're really stuck down. You want to rub it all over it so that you get every everything done. Don't kill it. And if it's too thick, you know how you end up with those bubbles and whatever, okay? If you end up with any bubbles, it does dry down. <clears throat> and what I mean dries down, and if you have anything that where you missed it or you didn't do it right, then no problem. Just simply um, put a little slit in it with a knife, a real sharp knife, and then um, put some more glue on it when it's after it's dry. Okay, and then we're going to go on top so you've made a decoupage sandwich with the glue. It's under, in, and over. And we'll let it dry like this, and we'll trim it after. See, I have a little teeny air bubble. I don't know if you can see it, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get you in the light. Right? But that bubble will, um, that's what I'm, when I'm saying dry down, that will dry down when I'm, when it's dry, it'll suck back down. If you make that noise, it helps. And go all the way past your edge and repeat the other three or the other two. Okay, because there's glue on all these edges and things, I really don't want to sit this down even on my drying mat because when it dries, it will adhere to this. It will come off 
but it will be stuck there and it will um, peel from the top. So this is where my cones are going to come in handy because it's not going to drape down on the edge and stuff. And I think I want to say, let's see, there's, there are, that's three, that's six, that's nine. There's ten of these in a set. So you can do one big project and two little ones or three of these little coaster woods with three um, on the platform there perfectly. This could be where you gently use your three-sided side, squeegee. I have a big bubble in there, and my fingertip wasn't doing it, but I would do it gently because you don't want to rip the paper, and you don't want to catch. That's what I also love about this really fine um, surface that we're painting on. Okay, and I got a little bubble. Yeah, <laughs> stuck to my palette paper. Okay, and then you could use the rubberized side too. This three-sided squeegee is turning out to be way more than I ever thought it would be. thought it was just a squeegee. Okay, and we've got my third one done. And I'm going to do the exact same thing to my other surface here. Okay, so I'm going to apply the background, the collage papers right onto this surface, just like this one. All right, so I know I want a butterfly word on my butterfly plaque. So what I did is I laid this over here. And I made myself a line with my triple threat. And now what I'm going to do is lay this. I don't have to have the paper all over the background. Um, it's kind of a good idea, but I don't have to have it that way. So where do I want that butterfly word? <clears throat> my butterfly is going to be in the middle, and it's, they're going to get the idea that it says butterfly. So I'm going to overlap that into there. Okay. And so what I'll do is I'll just come in from the edge. Use my ruler. Make sure that I'm straight. There's a very strong straight line with those words. One thing about the background papers um, or the collage papers, you may be laughing at um, how many times those of you who are watching this in the sequence in which they're produced will notice that I'm on a trend with these. And the reason for the trend is because to do this handwriting on the background, I tried it once and I, well, I guess on the Fall Leaves plate project I did it. Um, what a pain. Even if you're using, like I used a, um, a pen and just hand wrote it, but I have bad handwriting. You have to get the lines straight. You have to do it on a curved surface. Blech. Terrible, terrible. I did not appreciate that. And so be, being able to get the words in the background, I think it elevates the piece. It gives it a more professional look. Um, it just really just does something to it. So I've marked this off. That worked really, really well, by the way, um, marking onto the piece and then lining that up. Um, then I want to show you on one of these. I have a big old air bubble right there. And then this is the retractable um, detail knife. It's got super sharp knife. Be real careful with these. Uh, it has the little cover thingy that so that you don't cut yourself. But I'm just going to slice that. Okay, and I've got a pick I could use, but I think I can probably get under there with this knife. Okay, so I'll slice that, and we'll make just that little hole, and I'll use a little round brush and tuck some glue up in there. And that's how you get rid of any bubbles. But this with the, um, yeah, if you put the blade lid on, we're actually going to use this right now. Actually, I'll show you how to trim these. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so I've got my cutting board, and so we'll go here, and all you do, put your little finger in there. This, if you've ever used um, a Zacto knife, the ones where you have to like, you know, do this, it ends up denting this part of your finger like crazy. This is super comfortable because the pressure point is from this finger down, and that's that nice soft pad. It is not pressing on this. You're not trying to control it by death gripping that. These being super duper 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 sharp are brilliant. They just do such a great job of cutting. Okay. So then we just lay it down and then we just remove the paper like that. Look at how nice that is. That edge is beautiful. And like a silly willy, I have put glue all over this side of my piece and um, yeah, I didn't need it. So I'm going to hold this down. And you can see that's just blubbling, blubbling, 
make sure you wipe that glue off. I didn't on the other piece that I squeegeed. I like this. This works great. Um, and I ended up with a big wad of glue at the edge of my um, coaster. So I'm just going to wipe that off as I go so I don't end up with the other mess. <clears throat> Because I put this right where the line is, um, over here, I'm not worried about there being a transition. I think down and pulling towards you is better for the paper. It feels like there's less resistance. Okay, and now I'll go on the side and wipe off any mess that I have on the underneath piece. Yeah, that's quite a bit of mess. Then I'm going to do the top coat, so let's make sure that edge is down now that I lifted it up. I do all this while it's wet, and it gives you way more um, connectivity, if you will. And then make sure you wash that brush out right away. And if you don't, don't forget you have the brush cleaner and restorer. It's your friend. I don't think this glue over here will be a problem, but I may have to sand a little bit. Wasn't even thinking. Smooth it out just a little. It dries really flat. I mean, as much as I'm putting on here, I'm super amazed. At, I'll show you these pieces. Um, super amazed at how flat it um, dries. Okay, so I'm going to leave that to dry, but um, yeah, this is totally doesn't have any ridgy, brushy mark type things on it. Okay, I wanted to share with you, we now have these fantastic vellum sheets. Now this doesn't look very um, transparent, but watch what happens when we put it right over our piece. You can actually almost read the words. I can read the words. I know that yours are a little bit more cloudy, but I can definitely see the position. Let me show you over something a little more solid. Um, you can definitely see what you're doing through this. So these are fantastic. The weight is not too thick. Um, we finally found one that's see-through enough to make me happy. Um, so I'm super excited about that. So that size, I'm just looking to see if I like the overall look of it. This one is just right there, isn't it? I think that'll be okay. Might need to reduce this one just down a little bit. <clears throat> Maybe just a hair. Okay, and I'm liking how these look on here. That looks like a continuation of the word. I probably should have put Earthfly over here, so that way you kind of read it through the whole thing, but that's like a hindsight kind of thing. You could do that. And I want to have that band down here, and then I want to do this a color, and I think we decided the color. We've debated this color scheme for a while here. Oops, someplace I have. Um, don't put your vellum on top of your freshly glued um, board. That's not a good idea. This is a um, pop top, and this will, if you use that little edge right there, you can put that right in a new bottle of paint and it'll rip that plastic right off. And on those really stuck bottles, it's really good. And this comes in a really sheer plastic color. And what I love about this is this is now got to be about three years old, I think. And I painted this using paint adhesion medium. That sticks things to plastic and to candles and things like that. Um, and then I paint a little design. What a great gift for a fellow painter. So the color I'm going to try is eggshell. Ooh, that needs to be shaken. Okay, I'll try that. Um, and what I want to do is do a little um, test trial on my color to see if I'm going to like the color. So I'm going to pop that down there just in this corner. I don't want to do too much work that I don't need to do. 
then when that dries it'll be darker but so what I wanted was something that was very similar to that but not completely the same so I'll have to let that dry and see if it's going to be dark enough and then of course I'll antique as well okay this is um, Delta Deco Arts sorry Deco Art um, Deco Arts Texture Crackle and it is the tintable um, one the one that you can add tint to okay so we're going to tint it with antique white and actually maybe just only antique white and maybe a little bit of bleach sand so we'll make two little piles we're not going to use very much of this today make two little piles and you take out some texture crackle okay and mine is um, this gets creamier as you work it and then you're going to mix in some of this, just enough to tint it to the color. You don't want to overdo it because you'll break the formula. All right, got a paper towel. I've gone through the paper towels today. <clears throat> and then do some in the other color, a little bit more. darker you want to go the more you need to mix the paint in but you've got to be careful about not putting too much in you are limited by um, how how well pigmented the paints are and thankfully deco arts are pretty darn well done all right so now put the lid on so we're not getting dry crusties in there this product is really cool because it dries you can do it really thin usually crackle products you can't apply thinly um, and still get a crackle, but this you can do that. So in the light areas, well, yeah, I, I just, can I do it with my knife? I don't know if I can get this. Just here and there, the darker areas you'll have um, really finely. I don't want to take too much of the butterflyness out of it. I might have already done that. And we're, don't forget, we're going to tint. Okay, so that just gives us a little bit of that rustic look. That old world. This is really quite another color over here, but I think we'll, we'll be okay with this. Let's go darker over here. Yeah, we might need to go with just a little espresso into part of our pile of paint. <clears throat> Just a little bit. I'm liking that the espresso doesn't really turn pink when you mix it with a little bit of um, lighter color. Sometimes burnt umber can really go pink on you. this yellow color into here just so that they this block looks the same as the others okay that's just enough well yeah, you're too you're too high I don't want it very very high on this um, too much texture is this is gonna be distracting okay this is pretty much dry now and I think you can see um, how great this is a really flat almost seamless um, application and you can see all of those cracks it just really adds that just little bit of dimension to it perfect okay, we're going to apply a coat of celery green I tried out um, eggshell and then I tried light avocado and then I tried the celery and I think the celery is going to be our winner and we're just going to go ahead and apply it um, two even coats to get it base coated. Okay, when I'm dividing up my space, <clears throat> I think the thing that's going to make me happiest is to figure out how much space needs to be between these and even that up. Okay, and decide. 
I think I'm going to use these little um, book plate things down below, so I want to make sure that they're on the piece. So I can't have too much of a band coming down here. I can't have too much space between here and here. So this this is what I do when I'm putting a piece together. And I've got to say, look at this um, when we're doing this. I've got my pile of gadgets here. Because I don't, I already used my other round one, I'm going to go ahead and use my square one for this. Um, they come with three and three, so if you buy a set, you could use all ovals. So here's what I do. I lay everything out. I'm going to paint these so that they're all the same color. Anyway, I lay it out and look and see how I think it's coming along. Okay, so. And then I start estimating things. And so, okay, would we want, and this is where your um, triple threat comes in handy because I can mark on this with the white and I can just spit and erase and take it right off so I don't have to worry about making permanent lines. So this is, we'll go here with our ruler about a half an inch. Okay, so there's, uh, we better do that that way. Okay, so we go about a half an inch and we'll mark the top where that is and we'll do the same thing here. And we'll pre-measure it. Um, we'll measure it after and make sure, that, oh, you know, but okay. We would measure it again without all the stuff on it to make sure that my lines were straight. So then that could be the same and I could have a band that was maybe about I'm totally crooked line. About like that. Okay, that went all the way across. Kind of like that. Make sure that gives me space for these guys. But look at this with this on here. With a little bit of antiquing, a little bit of banding, you wouldn't necessarily even need to paint anything on these. This almost could just be wall art. Just so look at this piece. You could almost say that this is a finished piece. You wouldn't have to paint necessarily anything on these. You could antique them and, and call it call it a moment um, and then hang it up in your house and you're, you're good to go. Add your butterflies later if you wanted to. Um, just need these papers. Ugh, love, 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 love. Hey, on this um, edge right here, when I was doing my cutting, I didn't get it quite next to the edge and I don't like how messy that is. I want it cleaner. So I'm going to use the knife from the top. And that will give me a nice, clean edge. Kind of a little angled back. Yeah, that's much nicer. So don't forget that you can use it up top as well as down below. Oops, I forgot to put the thing back on there. Okay. Okay, to do the texture on this guy, we're doing exactly the same thing as we did on the other. But you've got to keep it really super flat because you don't want your glasses and things like that and your tray to go wobbly and wonky. So. You could avoid this step. You could crackle it maybe. Here, that's a little heavy. So what do you do when you don't like it? You just go in and you take it off. I don't want that over there. And that little bit of brown mixed in. And it's dry, you can um, sand it down just a little bit. get our line on here, we're going to use the see-through um, T-square, and we're going to go ahead and put both bands on there. Those of you who have astigmatism, then you need T-squares, and we have them long and short, um, but you will never paint crooked trees and windows again because um, the T-square will keep you straight. So what you would do when you were painting um, if everything always seems to be leaning one direction, you know you have astigmatism. But so say I wanted to have like a tree right here. And so say things always lean, like my line is leaning right there. I would go in when I put my tree on or when I'm painting my tree, and I would just lay this over it and see, oh, look, I'm over by a good quarter of an inch at the top here. 
and I would adjust my tree back to the straight or on my windows I would make sure that I always had a t-square and put my windows on that way that way whoops you won't um, have to have hang your picture on your wall crooked I'm gonna go ahead and mix some texture crackle for the top area of my piece and do I have any room left on my palette let's see if I can find a spot to mix and we're gonna mix green into it very easy um, technique. If this was glued, my palette was glued down, it would be a little easier to control this. Okay, so we'll move this out of the way. Make sure you put your lid on these products um, and clean off the rim so that you don't end up with stuck jars. I tend to be a little piggy and I don't always do that. Do as I say and not as I do. Okay, what I'm hoping for this, and I almost, yeah, you know, I almost feel like I want to take some and have it be a lighter color. I'm going to go over here to that color I tried earlier. And I'm going to mix some light, some dark. Okay, so changing my mind as I'm going along, let's put just a little bit of the dark in with some of it. And we'll have three very, very close shades. Maybe a little bit of brown. A little bit more brown. I'm wanting this to totally lean to a brownie green kind of foresty look when we get done. So now I have three colors, three values. If we get used to using those words like values and stuff like that, then they won't be so scary to us when we get faced with them. Okay, so I'm going to take some of the dark. Yeah, I like it. See how that's just barely tone on tone. I don't want this too high, too high of a texture. And I don't want it. Look at what I just did there. It's total block. I really want this broken up texture kind of stuff. Now I'm going to go into the middle area which will be just the, the same color when it dries. It might be a little lighter because of the medium. I'm putting this here and there. I'm not going to know what's going to show up from behind. And now do I really want some of this light? Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Okay, I do. Just a little random texture. All right, so we'll let that dry. Now we can sand. I've got this all dry now. We'll just sand to knock off any high areas. Great way to get that texture and look and not have it be lumpy. Yeah, nice and smooth. Great. Okay, right, we're going to do the same exact layout with this as we did on the original. And I gotta switch to my other color. So nice having those multiples of colors on deck. And then can I see my mark? Okay. There we go. This is nice because it just gives me the area that I'm going to be working within. So now, um, not only. Um, like I could go ahead and antique this and shade and stuff like that around here plus get my base coating done here. I'm going to attempt to do a straight up and down weathered wood look. So I'm using um, Decorts weathered wood. And then we'll go into our base color, which is the celery green. And I want to use, I think, some brown behind. So that's espresso. Now what 
we're going to do is we're going to put a little of this brown behind um, the color. And I'm going to mix it with the green. I don't want it to be too drastic. I'm going to put it here and there, about 50-50 mix. I'm going to go with the flow the way I want it to go. And we'll let this dry. Okay, and then we're going to put the crackle medium on nice and evenly smooth. Really, really important that you don't overdo it and really, really important that you keep smoothing it out. And you can stroke on this as much as you want. And now, look at me doing in a row in a row. I don't want in a row in a row. We want to do random. Okay, because that's prettier. Okay, so now that I've done that, I might have to paint over some of it and recrackle it. And I wanted to point out my crackle. <clears throat> Let's get you zoomed in. I overmixed on my crackle, and I don't really have any cracks. So I have good texture that I'm going to sand and get rid of some of these high points. But I don't really have cracks, but I'm okay with that. And so I think that that's a really good lesson to see that um, you can't overdo it. I have never actually overdone it. I, maybe I did once. And then I called the company and I was like, what happened? And they told me that you, you can't have too much in there, too much of the paint color. So when I was doing the paint, I was getting just a little crazy um, with it. So don't put too much. And then you will have cracks and texture. So, and then look at your pattern here. I've got up, down, up, down, up, down, almost like a keyboard. Let's not have a pattern. So let's do a little bit of weird stuff here. And this, so Crackle Medium is a um, directionally sensitive um, product, but um, not when you're stroking on the Crackle Medium. <clears throat> And so I'm going to keep my eye on it while it's drying because it starts, here, let me show you what it does. I'll get you in there. Okay, now tilt it and see if you can see. Now, see how those little ridges are right, let's see, look at, right over here. See those little bumps right there? That's what it does. And then those will come onto, it, it will actually show up in your paint. So you do have to pay a little bit of attention while it's um, babysit it while it's trying to dry, and then just smooth it back out. And that's one of those wonderful tips that you I I don't know why I think of some of the things I think of, um, but that has helped me immensely with the crackle medium. Now you don't actually have to wait till it completely dries. This is a um, the weathered wood is a chemical reaction crackle and the Delta products would be, most of the Delta products um, would be a drying time reaction. So they will only work while they're still wet. So this, I could leave this and come back, you know, a year from now and it will still crack. Okay, now I've got to decide what color is going on top of this and that is an interesting question. So I've got these guys here. And so I don't really want this to be on there because then none of my hardware will show and I really like the hardware. Okay, so if I put that on there, you can't tell that it's there. Well, maybe then I could get by without doing it, so maybe that's an idea for those that don't like the hardware. Um, go the dark color. So when I'm looking at that, I think that's just too heavy and strong. So maybe something a little more neutral. Well, I'm making some of my choices, so I'm trying to decide what color to put on top. So I take my paint chip cards that I've painted, and um, and I lay them down there, and I see, you know, what's making my eye go nuts. Do they really match up here? You know, blah blah blah. And um, I've decided to go with the fawn color, but the cards, when you do them, I've done them on the back of old business cards, and um, and they're just a great, great tool to have, so that you can match colors and yada yada. <clears throat> so now we're going to go with fawn. <laughs> Pardon me. And we are going to apply, we're going to apply liberal paint because if you don't apply it liberally, you won't see any cracks. 
and we're going to go in this case directionally and one thing that I want to do I have astigmatism I know I have astigmatism and I know that I always lean and I don't want a bunch of leaning crackles here so I'm going to give myself a couple of lines just to keep me on course those will come up and they'll cover up um, with the paint and stuff so this is just going to keep me on course and keep me straight if only it were so easy in life <clears throat> so the kind of scoopage I'm going to do <clears throat> is I'm going to do that so I've got a lot of paint on there but it's on the tip I'm not like working it into my brush and picking it up I'm scooping okay and we're going to get in and get out quick okay so here we go we're going to go right up to our line and I'm going to be a little careful up here because I don't want to make a big rigy mess Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and just, uh, let me flatten that out. We're going to take another tack. I'm going to go up here and I'm just going to give myself a little line, a little start line. And feather it down in. Okay, I don't have very much crackle up there, so I'm okay. What would be above that line? <clears throat> Okay, now I'll show you how to do it. So scoop it up and then lay it on and lay your brush back. Okay, so my brush is my brush is laying down almost so I'm like at this angle instead of this angle. Okay, really laying down. And then I'm just going to draw it down. Scoop and draw. I'm using the juicy side of my brush. And then I'm out of there. I don't do anything else in there because if I try smoothing, then what will happen is I will get um, I will pick up and make a mess out of my, um, I'll pick, I'll mess up the medium while it's cracking. It softens and does some stuff while it's in there. Okay, and I'm going to keep straight and going in a row. That's going to give me that weathered door cracking. The heavier the paint, the bigger the cracks. So if you want big cracks, you've got to use a lot of paint. And you can random it. Don't use only big paint. Um, you know, use thin some places and use thick other places. And the other thing, the more you stroke, the finer your crack. So I want one stroke for big fat cracks. Okay, and that's, that is how we're going to apply that whole row. Okay, and we'll get you close in. And I'll let you see, it's already starting to crack. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave it there and let it completely cure and then we'll start painting. This is my little layout and I'm checking to see if I like these colors because these come in like a reddish color and a silvery pewter color as well as this like verdigris gold color. And I think in this case I'm going to like this verdigris gold which goes with this and all I have to do is rub some gold on this one. And just a note this does not quite fit in this square um, thing so you would want to use your other um, your other round book title plate <clears throat> but if you wanted to use the square one just to have that variety because we already have the variety going on down here then what you could do um, this has got a little raised screw area here when you glue it on or you could screw it you would just put an extending screw if you wanted to drill a hole I'm going to just hot glue mine on and so when I do that I'll hot glue the plate then I'll put a pile of hot glue there that this will nestle into and then it won't matter that it doesn't quite fit within because it fits it fits nicely it just doesn't fit inside like these two do okay anyway so now I'm going to show you how to change the colors of the things like these if you needed them to be different so we're going to get out the metal powders come in two sample kit sample kit one and sample kit two and there's four colors in each we're going to use statuary bronze which looks like that, very brown. And we're going to use, um, what color is going to be most like that? We'll figure that out in a minute. But first what we have to do is we have to prep the stuff. So I'll move this away and move this in. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll get our alcohol, rubbing alcohol. <clears throat> we want to remove any kind of oils. Sometimes these come from the factory, oily, to keep them from tarnishing or whatever and so we'll remove any kind of stuff off of there okay and we'll let that dry 
Who else am I doing? I guess I'm putting a little bit of stuff on him. So, and I'm just going to rub the edges with this. <clears throat> you could, um, yeah, I think, I think I'm not going to worry about the rings around the bottom of that. While that's drying, let me introduce you to a new product. Um, I have here, this is a jar of magnet paint. And um, I didn't know if it would work, but look at the magnet stick to the side of the paint. Isn't that great? So there's like metal filings in here, and so the magnet will stick to that. But I didn't know if it would actually stick when you painted it. I followed the manufacturer's directions, and I did three coats, and really smooth, fine. You can't, I didn't sand it. I didn't do anything else. We did a chalkboard test on it. You can chalkboard and erase on it. And there's your um, sticking magnet. We did um, like a four-pack of sticky notes underneath our magnet. Seemed to stick absolutely fine. So now I can put a coat of any color paint on top of this and make it into my magnet board. Um, that makes, oh my god, that is such a great thing. So works like a charm, very easy to use, very, very thick in the jar. You stir it up and then I applied it with my oval glaze brush. But that's all I used to do the little coaster and that's not very much gone. <clears throat> but that was three thick coats. I mean it really did go on thick, but it dried very flat and level, so whatever properties I dry it, um, it said to dry it an hour between each coat and then overnight before you put the final coat on. Um, but excellent, excellent product if you're interested in making um, magnetic things out of your painting. Okay, we're going to use a coat of paint adhesion medium, and this is the stuff that sticks anything to anything, and it is brilliant. It works like you would not believe that's what this plastic. Um, and painting plastic is the hardest. I actually had a magazine article once I was supposed to write and I was supposed to <clears throat> paint a trash can and I couldn't get any paint to stick. I couldn't get the spray kind of paint that is expensive with a brand name. I'm not going to name names, but I couldn't get the plastic paints to stick. Um, and then I called DecoArt and they're like, oh, just use paint adhesion medium. It'll stick to anything, so I tried it, and sure enough, this thing gets so much abuse, and I'm not nice to it, and it, nothing is chipped or cracked or anything off of it. <clears throat> so we're going to take just a oval glazy kind of brush that we can rough up, and we want to just kind of get that all in there. Through it. There's a lot of cracks and nooks, and we don't want it chipping off later, so we want to make sure we get into that. You can use this under... Um, as your stick coat for just about anything. You can use it kind of as a primer. I wouldn't use it like on the coasters where I want that water vapor, water barrier. I would use, if I needed paint adhesion medium first, I would use the cork sealer after just to seal everything um, down. Okay, now we're going to let that dry. Oh, i got to apply a coat to this too. We'll let this dry and we'll come back to it. I'm going to move it to a non-wet place. We're going to go onto our tray and we're just going to tape this area right here. And you always spray it down. Use your finger. Nail. <clears throat> always, always, always spray down. Now I'm probably going to end up with a little bit of ridge there and I've got a little bit of bumps from where I did the, the oopsie. So I'll sand that down just a little bit. And I need the rougher one. You're sanding down glue in this case, you know. Okay, that's about it. <clears throat> and we're going to apply the celery green color over there. Now, what you'll notice, um, I don't know if you got this trick or not, but when I painted this piece right here, I painted the green all the way down. And I, I've done this wrong a bunch of times, so... Um, this is a really good trick. If you tape this and you tape this and you try to get those two lines to meet, if there's no banding line in the middle, um, you will almost indefinitely, inevitably miss the mark. So you have to paint the one color or the other underneath so that you only have to tape one of those colors. Okay, um, Very, very good tip <clears throat> when you're taping things. You can't yeah, it's so hard to meet two lines. Um, really, really tough. Okay, so we're just going to base 
Now that is quite a noticeable line that I've got there, but guess what? I planned for that for a change, right? Um, and what I'm going to do is that's where my pinstripe is going to go. It's going to go on either side on those lines. So as long as your line is straight, you're going to be just okay. And so when you're painting on top of tape, you never want to scooch towards the paint towards the tape. You want to put the brush down and paint right on or away from the tape. If you don't, you'll end up with big bleedy lines under there and you don't want that. If you're wanting to keep your the burned edge on the outside, make sure that you leave um, make sure that you leave it clean. So don't be casual like I'm being with your paint going to the edge. Okay, down there we don't have to be solid, we just have to go ahead and, there we go. And then peel, always peel at a 45 degree angle towards, um, towards the other piece of tape. And that gives you, what happens is when you go at a 45 degree angle, it makes a little knife out of your, um, out of your tape. And that makes a super crisp, I mean look at how crisp that edge is, it has been almost like it's been razor bladed. The next thing I need to do is trace my pattern. So I'll center this. And if I wanted to um, make this so that this doesn't slip and slide, what you can do, you can take and cut out. This one doesn't tear so well, so you need to cut that one. Cut out a little hole. Take a piece of tape. And if you're on a big, if you're on a big piece, you want to do two, um, two holes. But in this piece, I think I'll be okay with the one. Get it kind of centered, and you tape right there. And now this won't scooch from side to side. But love that I can see through. I can actually read my words through there. Um, love that. Someplace I'm looking for my little ruler. See if I have it about. Okay, it's centered a little bit low, so I'll bring it up a little bit. Okay, that's, that's about right. Okay, and obviously from side to side we're okay. So I'll go ahead and trace, and then this is where the triple threat is brilliant, is it's got a roller ball and a cushioned grip. So what happens with this is when I go to trace my design, it rolls evenly and smoothly over the surface, and because it's so cushioned, I don't get um, fatigue when I'm doing my tracing, which I, I know a lot of you have explained to me that, yes, you get the same thing I get. So it's brilliant. On items like this that I'm doing a pattern that has a very straight line, this, I would also use my um, T-square to line that up and make sure I don't have a leaning dragonfly. Um, he's got too straight a line against too straight a thing. If you have him cocked just a little bit sideways, it's going to look wrong. So that is another good use for your T-square and um, an aid for you if you have the stigmatism problem. All right, to match these, first I'm going to do statuary bronze. And I'm going to use the paint adhesion medium for my... These are metal powders. Let's get, let me get, gather my thoughts just a little bit. This is a brownie... Um, colored metal powder and they're actual metal um, pig, um, particles in there. It's actually like shaved metal. And I want to see if this is going to be brown enough. Yeah, I think that'll probably work. Dark enough. It's a little bit bronze. Let's put a little touch of lamp black in there. So this is what I like about these is you can mix and match and so I want it to look like metal, but I don't want it to look um, shiny under because it's really quite a matte thing. But I think black would be just a little too black. And see, that's turning just a little bit darker as we get it mixed in a little bit more solid. So that's probably really close. But let's go here, here of black, just to darken that up. And we'll still have our metallic sheen, but we can slightly tint the color. <clears throat> now it's more a gunpowder kind of metal color. We we'll use our same brush. Actually, well, yeah, we'll use the same brush. 
see if it works. We might switch to a dauber. Okay, the one we're keeping is this one with the gold on it. Now, this one already has a patina on it, so we're really just worried about this one right here. Okay, so we'll just brush that over and maybe a little bit more of the black. Kind of darker. Want that in all the nooks and crannies. But we don't want a bunch of ridgy ridge stuff going on. A little bit more. See how that's still not as dark as the black is? That's what I'm after. A metallic, and it's got, I can totally see the little flecks of um, metal in there. Okay, do I think that that's going to be dark enough? I think that that will be fine. Okay, and I don't have anything else to paint, so I'll just put this away. Um, the neat thing about this is, is if you're using um, regular metal paints, you are stuck with like 10 coats to get that done. They just don't have the pigment in it. It's probably very expensive. This little jar of stuff here will take you a long, long way. There's a lot of powder in there. It's the sample jar, but it's plenty. Um, the ones that I would buy a full-size jar of after you use up your sample jar is the brass, probably, and maybe the copper, because um, when you use copper, you want to base coat things and stuff. Depends on what your palettes are, obviously. Now I'll let this all dry. We're going to mix our brass color with something else because that is way too bright. So maybe we'll mix it with a little bit of the statuary bronze, maybe. See what we get. You want to actually make sure that you dip into these containers with um, dry utensils because you can actually rust the material inside your container. So if you don't get to it very often, um, you'll end up with rusty hard particles. Um, I've never seen it happen, but then I'm pretty good about using my palette knife. All right, I'm going to start with, um, I think I'll start with the gold because we'll need to tone that back. That's what we're after. And I definitely still want a little bit of metallic sheen. Okay, and I'll go into this and see what that's going to do for us. Oh yeah, that dulls that down nicely. It's about perfect. So just a little bit of the powder. That's what I love about this, is it's so easy to create whatever color <clears throat> you're going to want. It's a little bit yellower. I think we'll go with a little bit more. Just so that we tone that, and that gives it a little green cast. Did you know that black and yellow make a beautiful aged green? So when you're mixing black colors with yellowish colors, Generally speaking, you're going to get a lovely um, green patina. Okay, so we'll take the sponge dauber, our little lid. Um, keep the lids if you throw the things away um, because they're just awesome. And also, things like this with big open back um, things are great for using as stamps. You could totally make a whole pattern of overlapping stamps with that on your projects for backgrounds and things like that. So sometimes you might, might want to keep a little container of things that have cool um, parts to them. All right, now this is where we're just going to take a little bit of our medium really softly. And we will go over all the high points. across them. If we need to put back any of the dark, we know how to do that. Okay, and I think that's good, and then we'll add some of that to that. And then we'll have lovely little matching um, metal pieces. You'll base your bugs with, I'm going to use a round brush that I flatten out. <clears throat> you make your bugs um, bleach sand. I toyed around with leaving the words and making the paint really transparent, so if that's a look that you'd want, then that would be great. Give them probably, looks like I'm going to need two base coats. It's not quite covering. Keep it in your line so you know where your line is, though. We're going to do some dry rubbing. And the way that you do dry rubbing is you take a, this is a crescent <clears throat> brush, and it is shaved. It's cut in a filbert shape, and then it's shaved from side to side, and it's really short, and it's really stiff. And that is what you need. You need short, stiff bristles. And I like the, the skinniness of this because I can dry rub skinny, I can dry rub in circles, and I can dry rub wide. So 
it's a very versatile brush. Now we're going to take our dry brush into our dry paint, meaning I haven't added water to it, and we're going to dry it off or wipe off the excess paint on a dry paper towel. It is rubbing and it is dry. Okay, and it is easy. Very, very, very easy. Okay, so what I want to do is put some of this tint, and this is peaches and cream. I'm going to dry rub some of this peaches and cream out here on the outer banks of the wings. Okay, just add more paint as you need it. This is going to be just a little soft, subtle transition. You're going to treat all the butterflies the same way. The neat thing is you can alter a little bit where some of their highlights and lows are. I could do this with my eyes closed. You, be, beginners are, this is a brilliant way to teach them to paint. Um, basically what I've just done is shaded. Um, I've had, I have a strong area and I've transitioned it into a fade and it's just a brilliant way of getting that transition. Now I'm going to dirty brush, go into gingerbread, which may not be quite dark enough. We'll see. It is a good two values darker. And I'm going to transition from there into the middle. And I'm just going to go all over the middle area. Make sure you go to your body. Body will be all different color anyway. So see what a nice fade we're getting. Oops. And so when you get that really strong color like that, you want to dry off a little bit more. And then I'm going to go ahead and start in my darkest area, which is right there, and then I'll just fade it in. Um, because of all the black that's going on top, all the line work and stuff, I'm not worried about this. Okay, and now we'll get out our third color, which is going to be ox blood, which may not quite be dark enough. We'll see. It's pretty dark pink, though. So that's what you do when you're doing this, is you go in lightest, middle, darkest, and then just build a fade that way. By doing it dirty brush, a little bit of your paint is left upon your brush. Get it over there by that. And then we won't bring that out quite as far. Get out in something a little charming. We can do some washes later if we feel like we need it more intense. I'm liking the idea of leaving these just a little bit soft. Work a little harder to get it on the wing. Okay, and we could, I'm going to get a different brush because it won't work. If you change colors, it stops working. You can't do the fade. I'm going to get a little bit of primary yellow. And I could do this after I put the black in. I want to just scumble in a little bit of that out there just to pretend like that's a yellow or orange. Okay, that gives us a little bit of brightness at the end of our wings. Okay, a good way to clean off your brushes is to use a little hand sanitizer. Um, this will work only if you haven't loaded your brush with um, with color. Like if you put too much in there then you'll saturate the brush, you might as well wash it. But I want these dry for when I do the other ones, but I want to walk through the whole butterfly. So I'm just going to wipe out, and you don't want to put this in water, so what you're doing is you're cleaning your brush using the hand sanitizer, which will evaporate very quickly. And see how um, much color is coming out of there. I keep moving to a clean spot. That's pretty clean. I, I feel good doing that. And so now I'll just lay this off and let the stuff evaporate while I'm doing my line work. Wipe it off. Okay, and one more time. Okay, I'll let those dry and I'll move on to the line work. I've mixed just a little bit of my black into my charcoal gray to make just a darker something in between. They don't make one, so, you know, we complain that um, we don't like to mix, but then we complain that we have to buy 300 bottles of paint, and sometimes you just have to mix. So, um, hopefully this will cover all in one coat. 
Okay, and so what I've done is I've traced on all of the areas that are going to stay, and I'm going to make everything that isn't going to stay a um, dark line. So I'm going to line around all of the staying places. Some will be very fine lines and some will be rather thick. And sometimes you can't quite see what you've done with your pattern, so I'll move my, my stuff over here and make sure that I can tell what I think I'm leaving. And so outlining all of those areas first. Give you nice clean lines and then you'll simply take this brush and you'll fill in around the outlines. And that's how you'll get all your lines on there. All right, this is the fully outlined one and I've got some little lines in here. I'm gonna get out my micro eraser and it's just small enough to get in where I want it and take away my lines. Okay, so inspect for those because you don't want to find them later on and that'll make you bummed. Okay, and then we're gonna do, I'm gonna use just the um, that color, charcoal gray. Actually, you know what, let's get out a little bit of the espresso. I want a little bit of warmth on his body. Her body, maybe. I don't know if this is a boy or a girl. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to loosely base coat. My brush is dirty. I'm going to loosely base coat just to get a coat on there. That's a color, and then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stipple that color just to give it some texture. And I'll go into the charcoal, and I'm just going to pull that in and around on my edges. Kind of like shading, but not. Just kind of, um, I don't know what we'll call this. And the tail should be pretty much charcoal. And then finally I'll go into a little bit of the the dark mix. Oops. Okay, so we start going outside our lines. We get out super sharp, um, cute tip. And I can go right on in there and take that off of his little face. If I waited until my paint dried, I'd probably be having better luck. Okay, and so this is just like three colors in there somehow, and it's just giving the impression of. Um, having a little bit of a fuzzy body, maybe. I don't know if butterflies have fuzzy, fuzzy bodies. Flipping it over to do my antennas. Notice that I pulled in on one side and out on the other. That's just making it so that I get a good graceful line. Now I'm not super happy with how vibrant I am. Now I'm not super sad about it either because when I pull my piece over, and I put the square on there. The colors make me happy, but I think we could use a little bit more vivacity right there in the middle. So what we'll do is we'll switch to an uh, angle shader, and we'll go ahead and float just a little bit of the darkest color, which was um, oxblood. Okay, and then what we'll do, we won't, we don't want to cover everything up, otherwise we'll have to do glazes on everything. But we'll just give it a little bit of a glaze towards the middle and walk it out. That's going to pump up the volume just a little bit for us. <clears throat> don't forget you can use these misting bottles. And I'll add just a couple water drops, and the drops will stay and just get bigger. And then as you need to load water, just put the heel of the brush into a couple of drops the size that you think you'll need, and that makes a really easy way to reload without washing your brush every time. We'll give that just a little bit of a glaze and walk out. Okay. See, that's much prettier. Needed just a little pop of something. it over and do the same thing. There are a million ways that you could paint a butterfly, so don't feel like this is the only way, but this is a super simple way. You could do these for cards, you could, you know, you could just have fun with this. Alright, and do we want 
to maybe have just a little bit more yellow out there at our tips. I don't know if we want yellow or orange, but we'll try yellow first. Just a little bit of a pop. Maybe out here as well. And I think I want to go one deeper in our red, so we're going to go, we'll go Napa. That'll give us a little bit of a blue-red. And it's going to be such a small kiss that we won't worry about how much of it. Let's see if that does the trick. So see, I'm not bringing it out as far. Okay, I think that'll do it. So it's just that little internal kick. Somehow the darker the color there, um, it just helps suck the black into the outer colors. It's not standing so separate. Maybe if we wanted to leave it really lighter, we would only use the charcoal brown. Do a little shading around the outer edges with a great big ginormous angle shader. I'm going to start with the burnt umber and see what we get. Burnt umber is pretty transparent, so it makes it a fairly safe color to do this with. In the areas where you have crackle, you might need a little bit more water. And see that toe tucks in there, and then I can draw it down this way. That's why you need an angle shader. And I'll pick up some drops. I have to pick up a few more drops than I would on a smaller brush. So it's getting pretty around the size. I like that. Keep it off of your yellow and your butterfly. a little bit more paint. And a little bit more water. Got to some of that crackle medium. It'll grab a little bit. Sometimes if you feel like it's grabbing too much, then what you can do is you can um, varnish it with some matte varnish and continue painting and then, or some glazing medium. You don't want any of the white to end up showing out there, so you want to make sure you wash it into those areas. Okay, I think that looks pretty charming. And I'm thinking I need just a little bit of color tucked out in there, but I'm not sure if I want red or orange. I'm going to try the orange first and see what I end up looking like. Really, really, see how much blending I'm doing? I want that real soft. If I go in with a really powerful punch of color on the end, it won't. Um, I won't be able to control it. Okay, so we'll pull out just a little bit of orange. That warmed it up nicely. And maybe you almost kind of can't tell what's going on. Maybe. And we might need to do a little soft black in those corners too, but I don't know if we'll need that. All right, now let's take a look and do our test on our background. Okay, yeah, that, I think that looks super. We'll do a little spattering, a little bit of that kind of stuff still. But yeah, pretty good. I'm going to spatter the butterfly with... Um, hmm, I think I'm going to spatter with... Boy, I think we're going to spatter with soft black. I don't want it black, I don't want it brown. And I think we need a little bit of gold as well, but I'll spatter with this first. The less water you have, the more fine the spatters are. In this case, I don't want things getting away from me and being too spattery. So I'm going to control the spatters by not having so much water. Notice I'm turning every time I turn to get into the corner I want. If I spattered from here in, then I would be putting spatters all over this area, and I want them out there. That adds a nice little look. And now I think I'll go with a little teeny bit of uh, fine, um, what is the color, Napa? And spatter off, 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 off. And now that I did that, I'll add some, make it a little stronger and darker. Too fine. 
think we can give it a little bit of a pop right in the middle here. I'm going to anchor. And let that carry a little bit of the weight <clears throat> of the color. All right, now we'll get into some brass. And mix it with probably just some gloss varnish, I think, in this case. The spattering and antiquing will be the same for all of the little plaques and the same on the um, tray board. So you just carry that around for all of them. I won't reshow them again and again. Okay, so I mix that up. And then we put that aside and we mix some water in. And see how that is it's just like liquid gold. Batter hard. I don't want this taking over the world with gold. Okay, and we get this little gold going on the tips of our butterfly, and that just looks sweet. Can you see the spatters? I don't know if you can get the right light, but I can see the spatters, and when you do it, you'll be able to see the spatters. I think that's wonderful. Okay, I've got the same prep done there, but now as I'm floating, um, I'm just hesitating because I know that I'm going to need to stretch that float into the piece just a little bit more. So I want to go ahead and um, address that. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and angle it in, go across the top, and then when I get into that middle section, I'm going to try and keep my green neat and tidy. So I'm going to use a piece of tape. I don't want to have to repatch that. And do stuff even if it is going to have some line there. Don't have to worry about bleed under so much. I just want to prevent a big bunch of cleanup. So now I'll come across and I'll just walk that in. My brush is tipped down. It's not straight up. So you can see the difference. And this down here I don't care about because I haven't painted this bottom band. And I'm just doing that blended float like I showed you. <clears throat> and I do want to make sure I cross over that line so that I don't end up and I'm doing a kind of a circular smoothing motion over here in the corner okay and then I'll do a little chisel I don't want this to become really a dark dark piece but you can see what it does it picks up a little bit on the swirls it's it just adds that magical depth to it <clears throat> Okay, so we're going to try to get you back on camera. Here I go on our chisel. Just keep rotating it around as you need. circular chop chop motions. Okay, now we'll deepen that with um, the little bit of our red color as soon as that dries. But you get the idea about how um, you've got to draw that line out. You can't you can't tuck it just <clears throat> you can't tuck it just straight up here in the middle. You have to <coughs> pardon me. You have to um, draw it into the piece just a little bit when they're bigger areas. Okay, we're gonna do our little dragonfly and we're gonna use winter blue in a kind of a wash on the wings just to give it that pale kind of hintish thing of blue so I'll treat this one just a little bit different than the last than the butterflies and I've just got a wet little mishmash of colors of uh, winter blue, sorry. Now, these are going to be so simple. <clears throat> now what I want to make sure about 
Got this kind of set up here, how it's going to go. I want to see if I'm going to like these colors in there together. So what's going to happen is this is going to be antiqued the same way that these are. And then I'm going to put little spots of the blue into these and a little bit of the red or the orange into this. So hopefully then everybody will mix and match and, and live together. And this isn't irritating me, so I think we might be on the right path. <clears throat> I know not irritating is probably not a very strong recommendation. But boy, when things jangle, you know they jangle, you know? <clears throat> so then what we'll do is we'll come in here and we'll give this a floaty float float. Let's see what kind of detail we've got on his hair. He doesn't have as much detail, so we don't have as much hiding power as we did on the other. And that just gives him a little bit of deeper color. little bit on this outer tip. We're going to take a little bit of desert turquoise and we're going to just kind of float that over like a glaze not over the whole wing, just on the outer edges. Just needed a little bit of magic happening there, and turquoise seemed like the likely candidate. I think turquoise is a fun color. I think we'll leave that the darker blue on the inside, and then what we'll do, and I tested this already, um, is we'll put just a little bit of turquoise at the ends of a couple of the little wing things there a strong kind of little float there just to give it a little punctuation. I think I like that. We'll take a little bit of the ox blood and I think I want it real washy but a float. Just real sheer float. And we're going to deepen that blue in there. And then that gives us a little bit of our orange in our wing. without screaming, hey, I'm orange in the wing. I'm liking it. All right, so this is where we're at so far. And now I have my green, and I have, you know, my colors kind of established. I want to put a little bit of the Indian turquoise in my background. And I want to do it subtly. So what we'll do is we'll take a big dry rubbing brush. We'll load it in the Indian turquoise. And we're just going to smear a little bit of this here and there in the background. Where it might be seen. And it doesn't have to be super dry, I'm not worrying. And I'm going kind of at a crisscross um, motion. So now I'll come back and I'll do this direction. And I'm leaving spaces in between. I don't want it solid, I just want a hint. just enough probably and then we'll spatter always spattering with me lots of pounding off and I'm spattering on my paint bottles we'll spatter down the middle and we'll do something down here I'm not sure what we'll do to spread that love around um, and then we need to do probably a little bit of a darker green so we'll go with light avocado Ah, a lot of light avocado. <clears throat> and that's just going to cut that green a little bit. And it reads dark on the monitor, but it's not really very dark.
sometimes spattering can be your best friend because it allows you to um, add just enough yikes and you can antique your knob okay now we're going to do the antiquing around this bottom area we're going to start with our um, yes espresso color and I know I'm going to have a band here so I'm just going to take it right to that line and this is where everything starts changing I don't want this to get too dark and too heavy because I really think it's quite a almost a cottagey piece and this is very casual um, floating not worrying too much about anything I have to stay out of the other um, the wet area up above I'm going off the camera on purpose. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. All right, so that's a nice first step. We'll let that dry and then we'll deepen it. Next, we'll try um, deepening with a little bit of soft black. Might be too big a jump too quick. <clears throat> And I don't want it to become dead looking. It's a little bit strong. Can't decide if I'm a fan or not. Let me do the other side and we'll see. Yeah, I can probably like that. Here, just soften with my fingers. And then along your edge, I'm just going to just run just a little bead of that down the edge. A little deepening. getting deeper. Oh, I like it. I'm going to take a little bit of our burnt orange. <clears throat> I think it's burnt orange. Ox blood. And put just a little bit of that down here. Just trying to bring the colors around. Somehow we're going to need to have some kind of scratchy distraction going on here. I'm going to figure that out. <clears throat> All right, and in order for this to get big enough, I got out the oval um, texture brush, um, and I'm going to lay this into flat paint. Don't want to scoop it up because then you'll just have a wad of paint in your brush and nothing on your palette. And I'm going to dry it off a little bit. <clears throat> And I think I will go ahead and tape, just so I don't end up catching my green. Then I can start on the blue. I'm going to hold it together a little bit. And I dried off too much or talked it too long. A little bit more. And straight up and down. Just add one more weathered element. Isn't that cool? This brush is fantastic for making these striations. Now you don't want to flip it over and start from the bottom up because you'll end up with a totally different look. You could take this brush and you could also do some rubbing with it or whatever if you needed to. We might put a little bit of this color in our background up here. That's what I should have used to put the blue on with. If both 
of these have a little bit of that color in it and a little bit of that texture, I think I'll like that. And a little bit more. Awesome, I think I'm done now. Next we're going to shade the, um, the green area of the board. I'm at that place in my project where everything is piled up at the end of my, um, the end of my palette. I'm going to use Burnt Umber and I'm going to do it a little bit sheer. And then this is going to just kind of tone down and unify the colors, um, make that green not be so green. It's going to make it seem a little bit more woodlandy. I think is a word I just made up. And we are going to go all the way around this surface. So just long, try not to cut through the wet areas. We'll see. We'll pile things up on here and see how, how we're getting at our unification. We still have to finish our dragonfly. Okay, so then we start putting this stuff down front. Okay, this needs to get darker. I think we're getting there. I'm going to go ahead and glaze the dragonfly now. Before I finish him, I want to see how much weight I'm going to need to give him. That really brought those edges in, didn't it? And we'll do the orange and stuff like that as well. We'll try it now and see if we can get by with it. This was the whitest piece that we had, the one with the least amount of background stuff, so <clears throat> getting some of this busyness on there is a good idea. I'm going to tape our line. And sometimes tape bends as you're applying it, so make sure you apply it piece by piece by piece. Um, that way you don't end up with a curved line. All right, we are going to we use just a big old soft brush, like an oval um, glaze. We're going to just apply a heavy coat of burnt umber to the piece, and we'll allow that to dry. We'll, just do a solid base coat. The heavy isn't going to do us any good till next time because we want to do wet and wet blending. So at this point, just base coat. And that will cut that background so that the background won't show when we're doing our slip slap in the next step. Alright, so we're going to give it one more coat of the burnt umber, which I'm going to run out of. I just picked up some of, let's see, what is that, uh, peaches and cream, and I don't like that. We're going to go a little bit more orange. Let's get out gingerbread. Actually, milk chocolate sounds like a better idea to me. I want an orangey brown, maybe. Let's see if that's going to be orangey brown enough. 
Yeah, we need to wipe that off. Okay, so we'll re-base coat. And we'll pick up, whoops, I'm in my orangey brown. Okay, we'll pick up um, milk chocolate. And we'll just kind of slip slap that down there. Make them wet and wet here. All right, so we slip slap. Bring those areas in. And I just want it a little bit more scumbly, so I'm going to tap in that middle area. I want to create just almost a little texture, and I think I'm going to end up getting a texturing brush. I'm going to get the um, angle stippler, and we'll go into a little bit of the soft black, and we will tippy-tap around and around. And I see exactly where my line's going, so I'm just respecting those lines and using those to go around. Isn't it fun how you can add that antiquing around there and not float at all? Sometimes I think we work too hard. Got to get a little bit better light. So I'm keeping my clean heel into the center and keeping my toe to where the dirty part is, to the outer side. And that is how I'm keeping um, peace between the two families here. And if I, if I go back and forth a little bit, then um, I get a little bit more blend. And we might float one more time at the end just to settle everybody down. We're going to take a little bit of our orange color, our dark orange, just a little bit. So we don't want to be all crazy. Get you over there in the corner. And we want to kiss just a little bit of that corner with that color. And if that's too crazy, we might have to touch it with some soft black. And we'll bring a little bit of the orange up into the corner up here, down, down along here. Just hairsy hairsies. That's about how much I've got. Repeat on the other side. Warm it up just a little bit. We've got to be really careful not to go too far with this. You know, what happens, what would happen if I got it too far? It's always the question that's interesting because that's the one you want to know when you've gotten it too far, right? So what would happen is you could go back over and you could float some of the green. You could certainly, um, you know, just glaze over with the green. You could um, use the darker color to tone it or a complementary color to tone it. Um, you could base out just that area, which is the last resort you should ever make, and I don't like that orange in the middle. Just a little bit of orange up there. Okay, now I think we're going to go into soft black. And let's go over here and do this side. And this is going to neutralize some of that orangey feel. And we could give that soft black a walk down the, the path there. I like that. All right, craziness, craziness. I have got this stencil out. All I'm trying to do right now is decide. I like the see-through ones just a little bit better, but this is so pretty that I can deal with that. I just have decided that I need just a little bit more unifying going on, and I think I'm going to use that antique white. 
Mm, not enough antique white out. Okay, so my fail safe is if I hate this, then I'm going to go immediately and wipe it off with a damp paper towel. And because I've got the sticky on it, I can keep. Okay. It's bouncing up and down. I'm using the oval sash brush. Or the, not the oval, but just the sash brush. Okay, so I don't want to wait too long before I peek down here. I feel like that. I think I can live with that. And I'm going in the up and down direction here. Do a little bit stronger in the green area. there. It's not showing very much in the upper area because it's, of course, it's light on light. And I'm not doing it very solidly. And yeah, that just gives it a little bit of an all over pattern look. Get everything cinched down. And repeat. Alright, so I'm liking how it's bridging the back and the, the top and the bottom together. There's somehow or another it's making this connection that I needed. I needed a little bit of texture here to match this texture here. So I am liking how that looks. Okay, and so now we are about done. We need a spatter. Spattering is my friend. Okay. <clears throat> Let's go with the burnt number first. I think I paint to spatter. I think I've decided that. And we'll move these other pieces here so that we don't get more than we want on them. I'm going to go right down the middle. Turn the piece. I really need to be on my artist buddy right now. brush long ways when I want to go long. The best thing I can tell you about spattering is make sure you turn your brush to go in the direction you want it to go because it will follow where you send it. Okay, I am having a hard time staying on this camera screen because this project is long. So I'll show you one side and I'll take you off camera for the other side. We'll go in these corners with the black, green, uh, the soft black. Okay, now we'll use some antique white for the centers. see what we think about this. It may need one more color in there. We'll see. All right, I think when I'm looking at this piece, I think my orange on this tan color got away from me. <clears throat> and I don't think it just became another color. So I'm going to dry brush the antique white up the middle of it. I go in my lines again. and try to bring it back to a little bit more neutral color. Okay. And that 
is taking away some of my stenciling and I'm sad, but I think that, that this is for the best. Yeah, I'm thinking this was the orange or the brown that made everything look orange down here. And then it was like, yuck. All right, I'm going to put um, a couple of lines on here for my border. And that's going to bridge both of these lines so I don't have to worry about matching. And because I'm using my triple threat, which is a ceramic lead. That's what that is. It's ceramic. And um, these have not been available in the United States. This has been a really tricky thing to get. And I'm so delighted that they are now available. All right, so we're going to tape. And this is just blue painter's tape. I don't waste my stretchy tape um, for this because I don't want to spend money I don't need to. with as much as I pulled off and probably even. Okay. B. Okay, nice and pinched it down. We're going to make a mix of that um, statuary bronze in the brass color. So I want it to be brassy, but I want it to be brownie. So we'll take our powder, same thing as we did before, and neutralize it with just a little bit of the statuary bronze. So it's not so screaming. And we'll take a fingertip dauber, or in this case probably ink sweeper would be more appropriate because it's longer and this is a long skinny line. And we'll just go ahead and just tap, tap, tap. Feel our tape. Okay, nice line. Bring these guys back over here. And this is one of those test it, take it away, test it, take it away projects. So now we've got the gold and the gold mimicking each other. We've got the gold spattering mimicking. Um, we might could use some um, metallic spatters. That might be kind of a cool effect. Okay, now my question to myself is, do we need another band down here? And I'm kind of thinking, yeah. So, I shall put another band down there. And not as wide. I don't want that, that one up there is just a little bit on the widey wide side. Okay. When you get down to where only one of your arms is on your piece, you have to make sure that you're not overcompensating and yanking it around. So make sure that you put it on straight. Okay, we'll use the same colors we used for the other. And we'll just tap straight up and down. And don't forget to do your sides. If we're going to have color on here, we need to have color on the sides. Look at how fast that goes, applying color. Like, can you believe that? Ink sweepers rock. All right, so now we've got that repetition. Got a little bit of a finished edge, which I'm liking. And then I'll take my ink sweeper and I will just tap on my gold on my edges. Super quick. While I have a dirty ink sweeper in my hands, I'm going to blot it off and I'm going to mudge into, let's get you on camera, our paint bottles. And I'm just going to tint these corners with just a little bit of the gold so you don't quite know what's going on. I'll flip it around. 
and just a little bit to both sides. Up the middle just a little bit. And I think we need to spatter with that. Okay, this is the part where you get to say, oh, I learned from you because you make mistakes too. I don't like this, and it's not behaving, but when I put this down here, I do like this color combination very much. So I'm going to change this. So if you ever need to make a border like this, you could certainly do that. So I'll just tape off where my gold is, and I will do the same treatment down there that I did over there. So you got to be really careful to go right on the edge. You almost want to see a little bit of the edge. That way you don't have a hole in the middle. Okay, pinch it down. And I'll just have to redo my bottom borders. Okay, we're going to outline the dragonfly wings. I'm going to use thin, thin paint. And I'm just going to make lines that go down the wings, coming out of the middle. And then we're going to make those little um, cross-hatchy things go here and there. All right, then we'll just... <clears throat> Let me lift this up and see if we can get you at the right angle. Keep your lines thin. My brush is upright. Now this is the stupidest way to paint. You don't ever hold your piece like that because then you have multiples of moving pieces. So I should be up on a supported surface. Okay, now I'm going to put other little decorations in there. Um, but I'll get all the main lines on first. Okay, and I'm just filling in the little squares here. Just little squibbles. You can, of course, trace. No problem. changing gears just a little bit, as I put the, the weight of the butterflies all on here, um, I decided that I like the idea of one offset butterfly and a word on here instead. And if I had my other pieces, I would show them to you again. But, so, this is, this is how the design process goes. Anyway, so moving right along with that, um, thankfully you get to discover this before you buy the pieces. But um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a, the Easy Stroke brush because it is a brush that is a, like a perfect round brush. It snaps around corners. It goes like the, follows nicely around corners, and you can flatten it into a flat so it does base coating for lettering. And um, just a wonderful brush. There's only two round brushes that I like in the whole entire world, um, and one of them is, is this brush. Okay, I think this one's going to have to be brown lettering, so we'll go burnt number. And I'm thinning my paint um, with some water. And then I'm going to, let's see, dry that ferrule off. Okay, so we'll start someplace, you know, wherever you're comfortable. And we're going to pull down, and you don't have to do the whole entire stroke as you go. Okay, and I think I'm going to need more water. 
If it's not flowing off the brush, then you um, need a little bit more water. This isn't base coating, it's really um, um, doing like letter lining, if you will. And then press as you get to the fat. Oh, reload. My brush needs to wake up. And then lift up as you get skinny. Okay, and then pressing and then curling around. And I'm going to come back and give another stroke to finish. Okay, and then I'm just going to do that with all of the letters. Okay, I want to do a little bit of gold trim on the letter. don't know how much, but I'm going to go ahead and do a line on the back of the B. I've thinned that same mix of the gold metals. Actually, maybe we'll do this as like a drop shading. So we'll do it on all of all of the left sides. It just will be skinny and right next to the letter instead of normally I I would do it um, a little bit heavier and part of the background. I think that'll be really pretty. Okay, now to bring the greens together, we're going to go ahead and we're going to glaze a little bit on the inner part of the butterfly here. Make it look like we got some green action going on. We could give it a little bit of green in its leaf. I think we'll let's get that right now. Maybe a little bit of soft black. Um, okay. And then maybe a little bit more soft black down here. I say with a question mark. Okay, we're going to show. Okay, I gotta finish my trim back up over here after I changed it. We're gonna spatter with some soft black. And I'm masking this area off with some paper so I don't make a big mess out of things. Might have to spatter with black. Yep, a little bit of black is good. And then spattering with a little bit of the gold. Just to kind of highlight. Stand here. Might need to go ahead, I guess I've got a little gold spattered back there. feel like I probably need a gold border on my butterfly. Okay, one more. Okay, now I'm going to erase any lines that I have. Okay, I'm going to make sure to get them next to the gold and everything. Okay, I've added a little bit of Hauser Medium Green to my leaves. And I was thinking it would be cool to do um, this glass effect gel in the little colored areas on the plaque you could fill up each of these areas and then it would have a slightly raised Tiffany kind of look. Um, this dries perfectly crystal clear and um, slightly raised so it looks a little bit like a glass 
effect and that's gloss effect gel so to apply these puppies to the different pieces I'm going to varnish after I get them all put down um, then you're just going to use your hot glue gun okay and so I'll put hot glue on the back side of this and I'm a proponent of a lot of glue so and then I'm lining it up Rah. making sure I'm square that stuff grabs quick okay so now I have a little three-dimensional plaque what I like about this is it, it has a step down look from here to the green and then down to the brown as well all right so I'm gonna glue on the corners now the corners have a little bit of a trick to them and that is that they sit a little high um, this distance is a little bit higher than that distance, but they are so beautiful. I'm using them, and it gives it a little scrapbook look if you keep them up above. So what I'm going to do is put a dot of glue, a dot of glue, and a dot of glue. Whoops. And then I'm just going to lay these in the corner and let them sit and then as long as they are touching that hot glue when it hardens then they will be adhered and then we pick off the hairs of course okay the glue on these corners are a little bit higher than the edge is okay so like just a little lip to it but it adds a great um, kind of shadow boxy effect and it's not an excessive amount so I love it so I'm just gonna do my dots and I'll do generous sized dots but next to the edge and then I'll just kind of sneak in and grab that and let it sit even on the table and when that dries it ought to be good to go I'm gonna sneak that glue into there Rah! okay and if not we can always add a little more glue okay to get these guys on here all I'm doing is Line. loose out there it is I'm applying the glue here and here and then I'm centering over my centering mark okay ah. Ah. and we center and press and burn ourselves Ow. Okay, yeah, that's nice and secure. Perfect. Okay, and then this guy doesn't quite want to fit in here in the square one, but he's really close. So what I'm going to do is just put a nice pile of hot glue there and embed him in it. And actually, I'm going to sneak him off and... And then these guys, of course, are just a nice pile of glue and center. You could also screw holes, um, do holes in this, and um, that's another option if you'd like to give somebody that can drill for you. All right, just a couple more of these to go. I get the word on plaque uh, my um, tray insert is the same so I'm going to tape I'm going to tape right near the edge of this I could tape a little off the edge to straighten if I wanted to make sure okay and we'll do our first line and make sure we're not bent and then once again into our same mix powders. How fast and speedy is that? It's just wonderful. Okay, now I'll have to hit that with the dryer to be able to continue, otherwise I'll smear it. To do the scrolls on the bottom, we're just going to just use our round. <clears throat> Let's stroke those on. 
couple of strokes to finish it up. Some spattering. We want to put a little seal on this with our Journey to France passport seal. These are self-adhesive um, little uh, rubber stamps. And they look like this, and they're actually really fine. They surprised me how much they were very, very fine. You just adhere the little stampy poo to your block, and it's see-through so you can see where you're going to put it, which is wonderful. And I'm going to go in my gold powders that are all flattened out, and I'm going to make a stamp upside down. Very good. So it's probably important to look at which way you put the stamp on there. So a little water, wipe it off, try again. Okay, upside right is this way. And line that up. And then we have our little stamp right there. And then I can just wipe my stamp off and I stick it back in here and we're good to go. There's neat ones in here too. There's um, a great um, rooster and some stamps and some postage which I think would be fun. and photo corners would be very cool. Okay now we just have to do a little bit of finishing. We're going to um, shade on the green area with a little bit of brown just to sink that kind of in. And if you dull your gold, you'll have to redo it. So maybe you want to do this step before. Okay, that just gives it a little bit more family look to it. A little bit more in our corners. I might have to wait until it dries. Yeah, I'll go dry it with the dryer. So we'll hit it with the dryer. I mean, you hit it with the dryer. Now we'll shade it down just a little bit more. We'll do a little spattering too. This is kind of a rough it up kind of glazy float. If it looks too perfect it's going to ruin the aged look so be careful about that. I gotta erase my lines down here and then I'm going to go into our celery green and I'm going to bring a little bit of celery into the piece over here just so that it's not isolated not too white. Maybe we think that might be too white. Maybe we could glaze our wings. And we could do that same stronger green that we used on the other piece. Just give them a little bit of a greenness. And we need to spatter. And we need to erase. Big erasing needs a bigger. This is a really cool eraser. This has got, um, it's got a triangular eraser. And when I need a, a little bit more control, I can chop off the eraser. And it's a perfect little triangle. So I can get a big flat area there. Spatter with. I'm going to cover our piece up so we don't mess up with the butterfly area. And we'll go with some lamp black.
And then if we have any more of our gold left, we'll do gold up the middle here. And we'll remove it. And there we go. Finished except for some varnish, and we'll talk about that in a second. To varnish, you're going to use um, some DuraClear matte varnish, and the reason you want to do that on this piece is the same reason. Um, <clears throat> if you have, if you don't do something that will repel exterior type stuff on a tray situation, then um, then you might not be as protected as you want to be. So you want to put your matte varnish on, and you want to do about three or four coats. Um, apply it with a big oval brush and allow it to dry between coats.